to say our opinion, to participate, and to engage with government. So I think we have to work together in, in I'm particularly addressing the Southeast Asian context and make our governments in ASEAN to respond to this kind of concerns and issues. Um, is there a we need to, somewhere in the policy discourse and in the rights sort of discourse, define what it is not, right? Just criticizing a politician to call that hate speech is just meaningless in my opinion. So that's one, and the second thing is, um, you know, because that's how people then start to understand hate speech. And then it becomes very much restrictive of freedom of expression. The second thing that I wanted to say is that I think as users of the internet, who are sort of looking to sort of, you know, have our rights sort of respected, protected, upheld, whatever, when we use the internet, I feel like we are stuck between two things. One is policy, which is made at a government level, and terms of use of companies, which actually, of major websites, which actually represent their policies and which affect us daily as users. And the thing is, we have no clue about whether these terms of use actually um, adhere to any right standards at all, right? They vary from company to company, and of course, I'm not talking about every single website in the world, but if we were to just look at the first 10, it would be interesting to see whether these actually uphold human rights, like where, how these sort of relate to human rights standards, and it would be interesting for, I think it would be increasingly important for policymakers to seriously consider how corporations which are giant policymakers but unrecognized on the internet can adhere to human rights standards. Mics now. <laughs> Here in front, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Xian Honghu from uh, UNESCO. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I particularly I have heard so many uh, opinions from uh, local, from Asian, from Indonesian. Uh, I particularly on women issues, on gender, I like to share a little bit uh, what un my organization UNESCO is doing, because. Uh, it is a complex issue, as we all mentioned, at the policy level, at the capacity building level, a normative level, and we are, um, we are, our responsibility is really to keep our governments, our member states, responsible to to align them with the international standards on those uh, human rights, including women's rights, gender equality, in the in their policy making uh, related to internet. Uh, but uh, in the um, in the reality, it's really very difficult to, to reach uh, a sort of uh, understanding and uh, consensus on many of them. Uh, because on internet, uh, everything is related to uh, each other. You cannot uh, just say, uh, for example, human rights. Oh, our major uh, mandate is on a free expression, but uh, as, we, as we have seen in reality, it's related to so many other challenges uh, and rights, human rights, uh, free expression, and uh, privacy, for example. When we uh, try to discuss among our member states, we found that uh, on one side we said uh, free expression on the internet uh, should be equally protected as we did in the reality. But uh, on the other side, the many governments said that uh, nowadays that it seems that the states and uh, also individuals, they have lost their control of their uh, personal data and the information. And then we, we, we realize that these two rights, they are related and they, 
their relations tricky. Sometimes on internet they support each other. For example, right to be anonymous, a, a support for expression. You can speak more uh, freely when you are not identified. But sometimes they are also competing and uh, conflicting, uh, particularly for women. That is. In many cases, their identity, including their personal uh, gender and uh, uh, orientation information, can be exposed, uh, disclosed on the internet, which could be uh, threatening in, in, a, in a sense. So, so it's um, so uh, we we did a global survey on the policy and the regulatory framework in the, at a global level. Uh, yes, the existing global international standard is there. It's ready, but uh, if you look into the different uh, contexts in different countries, uh, they don't. Uh, many of them, they don't. Uh, they may have a constitutional um, standard. Yes, a free expression, women's right. But uh, at the level of criminal law and the civil law, there are many uh, vacuum in in personal, uh, in the privacy yeah. and also uh, hate speech. There. This absence, and uh, at the level of uh, company, corporation, self-regulatory framework, uh, that even worse in many uh, countries, in many companies, they don't really have a very effective protections on that, the privacy protection. Um, the Facebook is really an example. You you give out all your privacy to them, and uh, at the level of um, individual, um, we see. Uh, even for those educated uh, population, they don't really, uh, they don't, they are not very, very much aware of the risks and skills, their lack of the competence to to use, to interact on internet with with uh, with sufficient s skills and the ethical standard and the competence. So 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 these are all what we are trying to do. So w we have done um, at the policy level. We uh, we do the research. We study the uh, the different uh, law uh, legislation and the policies to to inform, to sensitize our member states to the governments, as you all feel that the governments have the responsibility. But the governments also need to learn to, to know what exactly happening. And they are also uh, feel challenged uh, at many uh, issues. Uh, when they will talk to the privacy to them, they say, Look at uh, following Snowden that uh, sure. the national security has been threatened. <laughs> we are Shan, is it okay to you, you know to okay, yeah, wrap it up? Oh, and yeah, sorry, yeah. so I'm we can uh, give I a little bit more time for other. Thank yeah, you. So, uh, so the strategy for us, uh, the first of all, is uh, with, I think we should have really have a holistic, uh, very comprehensive framework to look at each particular issues. You cannot just uh, focus one thing without uh, thinking of other yes. things. We need a harmony of all these human rights. Second thing, I think the, uh, the at the capacity level, we uh, we need uh, we really need a, need a package of the toolkits we can we can provide to our different stakeholders. We have done a, a media information literacy toolkit, which cater for the both the Thank trainers you. and trainees. And also, we have the gender indicator. To, to measure the development of media and, and ICTs at all levels, not uh, just uh, to, to fight against uh, the gender stereotype at all levels. Uh, if it with the media ICT, we will see uh, not only the content, but also the, um, the production process. It, it's women uh, e equally participating in the management and development of this media content and applications. So, so it's really a, a full package work which we should uh, pick up uh, holistically. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think Johan, you wanted to respond to the uh, question on hate speech. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to comment on uh, the comment from from my, my friend from India, uh, and I, I I very much agree with what you say. I think there is a there is a risk when when we use the word hate speech that that it all of a sudden it includes everything that we don't like. And this is clearly something we need to work with. And I think we have a, a quite a lot of, quite a lot of um, uh, um, information and, and leadership to find in international law. Uh, and I think that's where we should start. We, we, need to, we need to accept that freedom of expression also includes expression that shock, disturb, and offend. 
And this is important to remember. However, what is illegal and what clearly is, is within the realm of, of hate speech is not allowed offline and not allowed, certainly not online. But we need to be able to, to address it in, a, in an effective way. Is law lacking? Well, then establish law. Is law there? Make it work. This is quite simple. And I also get um, a little bit disturbed um, about, in, in, in the same manner, I think you enter into a slippery slope when you start to leave rights language and start to talk about ethics. Uh, to me, this, uh, this is clearly a slippery slope because ethics is a concept which is very undefined uh, in, in law. It does not give you a, a direction of, of, of um, justiciability. You, you can't make it work in court. And this is a concept that is used for political purposes. It doesn't say anything about um, your claims or, or rights. So it makes me worried when I see the use of, of, of the concept of ethics instead of rights. Clearly, some platforms, uh, private platforms, they, they limit human rights. And once you enter them, you also basically give up some of, some of your human rights. If Facebook has a policy not to show certain pictures that really are part of your freedom of expression, according to international law, then you effectively give that right away, right? So that is basically what you're doing. Is that a violation of human rights law? No, not really. You do this clearly, consciously, you know what you're doing. However, of course, states has responsibility if there are violations on human rights taking place on Facebook against Precisely, you know, I think there are the state responsibility. And in some cases, the state will exercise their mandate. But in other, in other cases of human rights violation, they won't. I think we see that. It depends on what it is. So there are two hands here. Yes, please introduce yourself. Yeah, 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 you. And then Val Valentina after. Thank you very much. My name is Gigi Alford, and I work at Freedom House, based in Washington, D.C. And I uh, really have appreciated all the, the comments that um, have gone before me and all the comments from the panel. Uh, the, the title of this workshop I thought was really fantastic about connecting our rights. And I can see now it's not just about how uh, you know, the rights we enjoy online enable so many of the other rights that uh, we hold so dearly, but it's also talking about where that connective tissue sometimes leads to, leads to a little bit of uh, conflict that we have to figure out what balance to use to resolve them. And uh, to this point about uh, really staying within the rights language, it's very empowering to do that. And I, I think it's really important to highlight examples of when uh, exercising those rights. So for example, when someone exercising their uh, right to free expression um, might lead to uh, speech that offends, how that can be uh, remedied with more speech. And there are three examples um, over the last year in the United States that I thought were very interesting, not only because it shows how uh, the internet is enabling uh, more right to freedom of religion, more right to freedom of sexual choice, um, and also enabling the um, the kind of elimination of racism to really come to the fore. Uh, so just very quickly to go through those. Um, Cheerios made a, a commercial uh, that showed a biracial couple. And uh, this, this commercial was posted on YouTube. And the comments that ensued uh, were very offensive, incredibly offensive. Um, but then what happened was very interesting. So uh, to respond to that, the blogosphere just erupted with a discussion about how um, you know, clearly racism still exists in America, and this was a society that was trying to talk about a post-racist society. Um, and having this example come to the fore really enabled uh, the communities to discuss. And then uh, soon after, a parody uh, commercial was actually posted. And it basically copied the entire script of the commercial, except at the end, instead of a you know, black father and a white mother, it was actually two mothers, a black mother and a white mother. And it was really just showing that we need to get over 
all of our different barriers and all of our different prejudices. Um, another one was uh, when the Miss America uh, winner was announced. She was an Indian American. And on Twitter, there was so much criticism. Um, and actually, a lot of it was uh, just get incorrect racism, too. They uh, couldn't identify her religion. They couldn't identify her nationality. Uh, but again, it really showed that this hate exists offline. And uh, then you know, being able to talk about it online was actually quite um, helpful and quite empowering. And again, you know, just um, hitting back at hate speech with more speech. Uh, and then the third is um, a very interesting um, service that I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is Reddit, which often, I mean, throughout uh, the years has been identified as sort of a, a cesspool for um, very offensive uh, ideas and, and language, um, but really a, a clear demonstration of what, you know, the um, full exercise of free speech can, can lead to. Well, uh, it was back to school time and a college student posted um, a photo of a fellow student who was a Sikh woman and uh, made some, some very unflattering comments about her. And then what happened afterwards was very amazing. Um, she goes on Reddit and actually responds in a very kind way, very beautiful language. And um, then the original poster actually responded in kind, apologized, and said, you know, um, really, that was a, a teachable moment for him. Um, and actually, uh, a couple other um, scenarios over the you know, next few months uh, happened, and then the co-founder of Reddit also spoke up to, to take a stance. So the one thing I really wanted to kind of tie those three uh, threads together was, um, if anything, we need to recognize that because the internet allows all of this free speech and allows us to see the internal conversations that are happening within groups, it's really showing us what has been there. And so it's not that we need to blame the, the device that's um, bringing you know, this to light. Uh, it's almost that we need to, to use it for the power that it's showing us of the you know, hate and ideas that are out there and then also using it to combat. So we can find these examples of where groups have um, you know, used rights kind of frameworks to, to respond in kind and to really change the debate. And that's going to be the transformation, the education, and the enabling of the rights that you know, the, the power of the internet sort of holds. Mm. So you're not bringing in just the mechanisms, but really the recognition of people to use their rights on the spaces. Valentina. I think you're high, you're high up. Uh, Valentina, Bosnia-Herzegovina, feminist internet activist. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank all uh, the panelists that have been really, really inspirational. I think that we are in a new world of narrative when we are into the internet, because it's, not, it's happening what is happening uh, outside. If you are an AHV person, if you are an LGBT, if you are a minority group of any kind, you will be bullied, at least. Uh, but what I would like to say when we were talking, it's, it's very good, very important that we frame into the rights. But still, if we look at limits to rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 29, we say that among the limits, there is... Uh, a meeting of the just requirements of morality, public order, and general welfare. So we would like to frame in terms of rights, and especially at the national level, it's really important to focus on rights. This is what we have all in common, all the groups. But we are constantly pushed into this just morality. Morality is far, even far more challenging than ethics. And so this morality is entering the legislation, because whenever it's about public order, whenever it's about pornography, all this stuff, the morality is there to hunt down each and every one that is different. And the morality becomes physically aggressive. I face this, and I think all the people that were talking here, they were talking about something that starts online or expressed online and very often finish in physical attack. So how we can manage and how we can limit also this, uh, this expansion of morality. And one notice regarding Facebook, is it a contractual relation? But it's not a contractual, contract, equal contractual relation. I can say yes or no. If I say no, I'm outside. All these small letters are done in a way that I cannot go through all of them. It's a commodification of rights. 
I don't like Facebook, but all the civil society of Bosnia and Herzegovina is on Facebook. If I want to be there to lobby, to talk, to advocate, I have to accept that it's an equal concern. And my state or some other state will have agreement with these uh, big contractors and commodificate my rights even less because they will decide what to hand down. They will go really narrowly to that specific page that has to go down. We had a press conference and we had been threatened because it was about LGBT rights, it was a coming out, and came five young fascists that threatened us all. In 10 minutes, we know who they were. The police will not know. They will not look into the Facebook. They will not look at the audio recording. They will not do a simple research. But if we protest, they will know who are our address. They will reveal our handle. So it, there are too many layers, and I think that the rights is the only frame we have as activists. But they use morality, they use a, a closed door agreement, how we make this working. Thank you. We have one more hand here, and then we can this part. Oh, and we have more hands now. <laughs> OK, that part. I think there's one more mic around so that it, we can move faster. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Godwin uh, with Internews. Uh, one of the things that, uh, by the way, this has been a very, very uh, interesting and informative uh, uh, discussion, not just from the panelists, but also from the other contributors here who are attendees. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've noticed in, in, in my work uh, on, uh, on, on Internet-related uh, human rights, which I've been doing now for uh, around 25 years, has been that um, governments tend to react to uh, 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 social adoption of the internet by passing prohibitions. They, the, the instinct is to say, here's, this, here's the internet, the internet poses certain risks and problems, and the beginning impulse of government, uh, really of any government, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know, uh, an ostensibly democratic government or governments of, of more closed societies, the reaction is first to pass prohibitions. Uh, and one of the things that I would like to see emerge uh, is, uh, is the impulse for governments to speak first to the Internet in terms of uh, uh, positive rights guarantees, uh, expressly recognizing uh, 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 internet-related human rights as the baseline for understanding what all following regulation uh, and, 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 and criminal laws and other uh, legal prohibitions have to be measured against. So human rights has, has, has to be, there has to be a beginning, the human rights framework. And I noticed that, uh, 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 entertainingly, one of my colleagues here is also from the Philippines. I know that in the Philippines, uh, you know, you've you've had the you had the Cyber Crime Act of 2012, uh, which laid out which was laid out a lot of prohibitions, and then a lot of the reaction has been to come back and say, no, we really ought to have rights on the internet, and that maybe is a thing that we should focus on in the Philippines. And, and the same thing, by the way, has happened also in in Brazil, and it's happening elsewhere around the world. Um, and it's the nature of rights guarantees that. Um, of human rights instruments that when you start guaranteeing human rights, there are always people who will use those rights abusively. Uh, and that, I think, touches on the hate speech uh, issue. But, but, but having said all that, I, I wonder if we can begin to form a consensus as uh, activists, as participants in civil society, as representatives of governments or representatives of companies that we all have to begin with a baseline of rights guarantees and measure everything we do against that, those standards. Very good point. We have two more hands, and let's do that, and then we can some, some have some responses from, from the floor and from the floor and also from the panel. Yes, at the back there. I think that's Nisa, and then on the end. Thank you. My name is Nisa from Women's Solidarity for Human Rights Indonesia. Well, I want to add something in Indonesia context, but maybe we can uh, get the learn also from other countries. 
Um, yes, I agree that uh, government should be responsible uh, to guarantee our rights in the internet. But what happened in Indonesia uh, in term of protection? Uh, we have the law on 2008 about like internet and electronic transition, but that law finally used for criminalize citizen like bloggers, women human rights defender, students, etc. Who speak out on the internet, who critics who critics to the government on or others. In the other hand, like Kamel mentioned before, we don't have any mechanism or any infrastructure for uh, enforce that be really able to enforce the cyber crime or online trafficking or others. So um, we have to see like two dimension of uh, rights on the internet. So maybe you can, uh, I can get the suggestion from the panel or, or also for the, from the other participants. What kind of law, or if you have any experience, how the law have a clear definition or or clear regulation, so it can be be able to protect us, but it won't violate our, our rights. Also, thank you. Yes, thank you. Over there, on the at the end. Hi. Um, my name is uh, Sharizan Johan. I'm from the Malaysian uh, Center for Constitu Constitutionalism and Human Rights. I'm sorry, I have to read out my uh, name tag. Uh, I'm also, uh, we also work with Freedom House. Uh, just to share the uh, Malaysian experience, because we get the sim a similar experience as to what um, um, the friends from Indonesia mentioned about uh, hate speech when it comes to LBGT and other, uh, and women's rights and all that. Um, we, we get uh, those kind of uh, experiences as well in, in Malaysia. Uh, and to us, and, and, and the law won't really protect because, uh, as I think another person mentioned, the, the authorities will not do anything when it comes to uh, LBGT rights and protection and all that. It only when, when it involves uh, 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 things which the ruling coalition might have interest in, then the authorities will step in. So we found out that the best way to actually counter this kind of hate speech is actually, as, as uh, Gigi has mentioned, is to actually uh, uh, talk to them or to, to start a discourse. Uh, uh, the good thing in Malaysia is that although there's uh, hate speech and there's a lot of uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, expression, it, there's also a lot of sane voices to counter the hate. And I think strategically, groups uh, need to work together. So not just the traditional alliances, for example, you know, uh, LBGT rights and women's rights uh, working together, but beyond the traditional alliances. So, for example, perhaps you can work with uh, religion-based NGOs or law organizations and, and et cetera, so that whenever there's, there's a hate speech outside uh, that is posted on the internet, uh, the others, the other organizations can actually step in so, for example, if you talk about if, if in, in the situation that was given where they say that it's a disease, do not spread this kind of disease uh, on, on the internet, maybe if you've got an alliance with uh, doctors, they can actually say, look, this is not a disease. Or, you know, religious NGOs can actually give a, a counter it from a religious point of view to say that, look, you know, this is not against religion. I know, I know perhaps the conventional wisdom or, so, or, or discourse is that it is, but you know there are also points of view from the religious perspective to say that it is not uh, against the religion. So these kind of things, and perhaps lawyers can also educate to say that this is a rights issue. So you may disagree, but you know you must respect the right. Um, and we have found that this is is quite effective in Malaysia. So at the end of the day, whenever uh, uh, there is counter arguments, uh, we notice that uh, a lot of the hate will either. Uh, they will either try to find some sort of uh, um, a common ground with you or they'll just uh, uh, go away. So that's one strategy which perhaps can be employed uh, taking from the Malaysian situation. Thank you, that's very useful. Um, yes, there, there's more hands. Um, yes, one more and then we can then get the panel to respond. I think we're running, oh, actually we've run out of time. Um, so can you make it short, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, there's yes. no other play session after this? Oh, okay. So if you want to just stay a little bit longer, we can 
So please. Okay, it would be a short conversation yeah, because my English is not so well. <laughs> so uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Putu. I'm representative of an uh, organization for wo women who live with uh, HIV and AIDS. Uh, so I want to talk about the uh, discrimination we get that we are in Bali, uh, we are, um, when we, we got this disease, we got HIV, we are rejected. We are rejected by our own family, we are rejected by our uh, ex-husband family, and we are rejected by our surrounding. Uh, and the big problem is because of the less information. That's why I'm here, I want to talk that how internet will help us to get normalism. Uh, how that uh, we, we, we want to, to, to live, we want to, to, to continue our life, our life without uh, discrimination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, shall we get the yeah, response, Jelen? And then if Camille, you want to respond? Yeah, um, my response is on what Valentina mentioned about the expansion of morality and what our colleague mentioned about the positive rights. Uh, so let me take the cybercrime law of the Philippines as an example. One major contention that we were raising at the time was the inclusion of cybersex as a content-related offense. Even without legal definition, when we refer to the word cybersex, as something, I mean, as a common, it's sex, it means consensual, it means something that you like, maybe, or you enjoy. Um, it's not very clear in terms of how it was phrased, cyber, cyber sex, no? Um, as what is the crime on the cyber sex? Why it's being considered as a crime? And I think this is what um, Valentina is trying to point out, that there is an expansion of morality here. So, for example, in the Philippines, you all know that we have a lot of migrant workers. And one major um, link, I mean, connection that we had with, with our, maybe with some migrant workers' partners, is through ICT. And some would maybe engaging in cyber sex. So when we speak of cyber sex as a content-related offense in the Philippines, are we also saying that those migrant workers engaging in cyber sex with their partners abroad are also committing a crime? Of course, the answer of our government at that time is it will not include, I mean, that will not be included. But what we were saying is that what we are trying to criminalize here are sexual violence committed in the cyberspace. We have to be very clear in terms of how do we use language because language really are very powerful. So I think the role of social movements like us, CSOs, women's rights, internet rights groups, is to raise awareness and to use language as a powerful tool. Language is both powerful not only in society in influencing the language of other CSOs, influencing them, but also in creating normative standards, in creating stand or standard setting. So um, when we had that position, along with other groups like FMA and FIFA, other groups working on internet rights, we had more allies taking on our issues, why we are against the passage of the cybercrime law, why we are not in favor of including cyber sex in the cybercrime law, why we think that the cyber sex provision is, is a way of expanding morality and not an exercise of the positive rights of women. Because most likely, most women will be apprehended, most women will be put into j in, in jail, but not those who are subscribing to these women. I, we, of course, I'm talking of the crime, and I'm not talking of the consensual sex. And it actually deprives the right of women and men, or women to women, men to men, to engage in cyber sex, especially if they think it's something that they find what uh, sexually desirable or whatever. My, my anal or sex is... <laughs> So another concern that I would like out to point out, yeah, just last, is on the balancing of rights and responsibilities. Um, it's being used basically negatively in the ASEAN context. And I think that's something that those two are trying to influence the language of balance, balancing rights and duties to make progressive interpretation of what it really means. Because it's always being used at 
as the ASEAN having a different context. And um, I'm, I'm very, uh, we're very vigilant in terms of how this particular usage of balancing rights and duties can also be used uh, to suppress freedom of expression and in the ICT. Lisa had a specific question, so I'd like one of in the panel to respond to her question. And she made a direct question as where she's going to find that information. So who else? Joy, do you want to? Thanks. Um, and it's, it's great to be um, in, a, in a workshop where the panelists are completely overpowered by the brilliance of our participants. Um, so thank you very much. I've really enjoyed the examples, actually. And I think I just want to pick up on a couple of points. Um, one is, I think, definitely uh, we see governments responding out of fear in, in some cases in, res in relation to regulating content, um, but not also out, not only out of fear, but also out of opportunity. You know, here's a chance to regulate in ways that weren't possible before um, and, to, and to extend reach into control of content and expression that weren't possible before. So I think that pushback is critical. Um, I want to re also respond to those who've said, you know, the limits, there are limits to the remedies that we can take with law. I think that's absolutely right. Just as, you know, while we have the same human rights online as offline, our access to justice offline is still mediated by so many things. Uh, you know, our, our gender, our income, our position in society, knowledge, and, and, and so on. So I think that linking of strategies, online and offline strategies, is actually really um, critical. Uh, I think, and I think also capacity building, I think Johan and others mentioned it earlier, particularly for national institutions and others so that when they get these cases, we get good decisions and they do respond, whether it's police uh, you know, or, or otherwise. Um, in relation to the um, question about the more speech and the examples about more speech, I, I, I think it's absolutely true to say that the uh, technology empowers and creates spaces where hate speech and bad speech and ill-informed negative speech can be responded to. But that's not always enough, and it doesn't... While there are good stories, um, often that, uh, the, the ability to respond with more speech is mediated by gender, by class, by uh, positions in society, and sometimes it's not just about speech. If you look at the banknote case of the, uh, recently in England of trying to get a woman on at least one of the English banknotes, um, and the campaign um, uh, against the woman who created this uh, and the hate speech that she was subjected to, the violence, the threats, um, I think it wasn't really just about um, responding with more speech. So I think we need lots of strategies is where I'm going with this. <laughs> and there isn't... Th and, 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 and sharing strategies, I think, um, uh, and having multiple com complex ones is, is, is useful. And it's really nice, I think, to think that... Um, this conversation, I think, would be very helpful for internet rights activists who are very limited in their discourse around freedom of expression. And I think we, that's something we should think about sharing back to other, other sessions. And just to add to that, also an example in Pakistan recently that I heard of is that precisely, you know, that the, the hate speech, the, the intensity of it actually forced a women's human rights activist to have to, um, how do you say, you know, not to be in the space and in fact, really a personal safety issue that was a threat to their lives. So it had that, those kinds of implications. So it's not, you know, there, there, there are differences depending on the context. Camille, can you, did you want to say, did you want to speak also? No? The mic is over there. <laughs> and then we call you on. Um, I guess, yeah, uh, I present more about the case and then what happened is the violence and discrimination faced by women and LGBT. But I also want to share like a uh, very good initiative actually from the Indonesia AIDS Coalition. Uh, it's also maybe answer a little bit about your questions, uh, how uh, it provide a um, positive space and supportive space too for, for women uh, living with HIV AIDS. So this initiative is called uh, Digital AIDS. They, they, they actually, what they're doing is actually um, trying to map um, information because they feel that whenever they want to ask info information in public space, sometimes they feel embarrassed and confidence. So this application is um, 
really helpful to the community. So far, I, I guess it's quite helpful for the community. And also, I, I just want to share about um, our conversation yesterday also in one of session that the challenge is um, when we are talking about internet rights and internet governance is even in the level of National Commission on Human Rights, they feel like internet rights is not um, important or urgent issue right now in terms of there are a clean water rights, toilet rights, um, and other um, health and economic issue. So in, that is in that uh, National Commission human rights level. And also especially on a civil society movement, they feel like internet rights is not really urgent issue right now. But I feel um, that kind of challenge uh, is also, uh, there's a, a story about that. Actually, there are uh, research telling that now people having more mobile phone rather than to, to choose to have a toilet in their house. So <laughs> how we respond that? Like, um, that is a challenge, but it is also a, a, a research saying that uh, communication right now is more important than toilet. So, <laughs> so I, I just want to close right that that um, we should do more follow up after discussion with a local, national, and international level. I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thought that was a very interesting example. Um, it tells you something about the importance people people give to 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 the ability to communicate and to speak uh, and to share and to learn and to trade and whatnot. Anyway, I wanted to say that I think this conversation has been really useful, and I'm very grateful to to have the opportunity to join. Um, I think, uh, as Joyce said, it's important to to continue to to minimize the gap between digital rights activists and human rights activists. It's really important, and I think this this discussion here is helpful in, in that respect. Um, we were talking about creating baselines. Uh, my friend from Internews uh, asked about baselines. And I think we have some baselines uh, that we could use. Um, the Resolution 28 from, from the Human Rights Council is definitely a baseline for governments. Um, and I think for companies, we are seeing increasingly uh, creation of, of frameworks that can be used. Uh, I think of, of the Global Network Initiative, for example, which sets human rights-based guidelines for companies. And recently we've seen the, the industry dialogue creating a similar framework uh, aimed at telcos specifically. I'm not saying these frameworks are perfect, but I'm saying it's, it's a good step. Uh, the GNI also includes responsibilities for companies to open up their books to, to audits, which is, which is very useful and quite, quite powerful. Um, and I understand that also uh, Facebook has now joined the GNI, uh, which should also open their, their work more to transparency and insight, which is important, very important. Uh, I think also we're seeing um, on, on the remedy side, we are seeing some work being done now in the Council of Europe, looking at what does this mean in a human rights context. And uh, we hope that the Council will adopt a text that also uh, will, will state that people can reasonably expect that companies should also give people the, a right of remedy. So if your rights have been violated by a company, there should also, you can also expect that the company would have a responsibility to give you some kind of remedy or possibility to, to complain, a complaints mechanism. Um, while not yet part of a human right per se, we are seeing that these discussions are taking place in increasingly, uh, increasingly many fora at, at the moment, which I think is useful. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, yeah, I think, I think we need to close the session. Thank you very much for all the, the contributions and also for the panel. I think the, the, the last few comments really sort of you know, identified some of the strategies that we, that we can move forward with, which is really what we wanted to come out from this workshop. And this we want to bring to the main session around human rights so that then it 
uh, in this in the IGF so that it can be part of the outcome document coming out of this um, forum. So I think the only the one other thing that you know that I would just stress as well is this expanding of the public discourse of rights as one of our strategies, which is really important. Um, so that you're sort of empowering not only users, but also you're looking at the different um, activist organizations, so civil society, to be able to understand the connections. Because that we draw, it seems to me, we draw strength from that movement overall. And, and I think even in terms of just experience, I, I've been working around women's rights for a long time. We've seen in the last 10 years how that has come into the mainstream and how these movements are now taking it as part of their own issues. So just to um, add that to the mix. And thank you very much to our panelists and to all of you. So what is the th terima kasih? That's the, that's the third, that's the third uh, Indonesian phrase, terima kasih. <laughs>